Hello, I'm Andrew Hughes, and I'm going to talk about pore space, processes and predictions, how modelling helps proper exploitation of the subsurface. So I'm going to load you all up into a virtual charabang and take you on a trip, take you in the vehicle around to two places in the UK. Firstly, we're going to look um, literally under our feet where we are now into what's going on in the Thames. And secondly, I'm going to take you up to the Lincolnshire coast and beyond. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, show you literally what lies beneath us and we've drilled at no expense spared a virtual borehole. So literally as we enter Green Park Station we're going to see what the geology is beneath our feet. So the, the borehole we've drilled um, is goes through the London clay at the first 50 metres, 15 metres of the Lambeth group, 10 metres of the Thanet Sands and then we're through into the chalk, and the chalk is the, the main aquifer in this area. And now how do we get these boreholes? Well, what we use is um, three-dimensional models, and um, I'm obliged to show you a spinny one here. And what we're seeing at the moment at the top of the screen is um, the Cotswolds, the Jurassic limestones in the Cotswolds, and the greens are the chalk, and the purples are the, um, the London clay, which we've just been looking at. Now if we colourise those up into the aquifer units, the blue represents the major aquifers, the brown the non-aquifers, and the sort of orangey um, yellow colour are the sort of intermediate aquifers. And what's more impo most important is the fact that there's no lateral connection in the subsurface. So when we look at these, the important consideration is that if a particle of water falls on the Cotswolds, uh, it can't make its way underground to the chalk in the centre of the London Basin. So we have to conceptualise the system as a series of chunks and you can see again on the screen the chunks coloured up in the same way as before, uh, blue for the aquifers, brown for the little aquifers and yellowy orange for the intermediate aquifers. And the only way that they can communicate is by passing water into the river system uh, the tributaries of the Thames and then exchanging water with the other aquifers further downstream. So now what I'd like to do is to tell you is to give you the answer to so what? Why do we need to consider groundwater systems in the Thames Basin? Well firstly I'd like you to um, reintroduce you to the geology in a, in a little bit more detail. Um, and what we're going to be looking at here is a simplified geology of the Thames Basin. So at the top of the screen you can see the, the Cotswolds, the Eolitic limestone in the single hashes and in the centre and the, um, the bottom right of the screen you've got the outcrop of the chalk in the cross-hatched areas. So what we're looking at now is the distribution of rainfall compared to long-term average, that is between 1961 and 1990, for the 75-76 drought. So the um, oranges... Um, are looking at between 50 and 60 percent of long-term average. So you can see it's quite a severe drought. So now we're looking at the 1988 to 92 drought and you can see that it's um, the colours are less um, aggressive. The, the, the long-term average the rainfall during the drought is a lot higher and um, we can see it's still quite homogenous. There's still the same severity of drought over the whole Thames Basin. When we go on to the 2004-2006 drought, we start to see some quite interesting features. Again, it's a similar severity over most of the basin than the 88-92 uh, drought. But if we look to, west, to the west where the um, Cotswolds uh, Jurassic limestones are, you can actually see that the rainfall is above average. It's actually, so we're not in a drought. And this has really important implications for the water resources in the area. It means that rainfall falls on the Cotswolds and then supplies the upper part of the Thames. And the suspicion is that um, the, during this drought, actually what happened is that the flow in the Thames was kept up, which meant that not only could surface water be abstracted, but also that groundwater licences linked to surface water could also be carried, continued to be abstracted. So we need to understand how um, droughts, how heterogeneous droughts are um, and how these relate to the water resources in the Thames Basin. So how are we going to understand and simulate these systems? Well what I'd like to do now is take you on a virtual flyover 
London. We're going to start from the east and I'm going to show you a couple of things. So firstly, we're just flying over the, um, the London clay that we saw earlier. And as you can see, we're passing over the red lines, which are groundwater contours as predicted from a distributed model of the chalk. And the blue lines are the um, river system itself. And so as we go further um, west, you can see we're passing over the chalk outcrop now and you can see the rivers underneath. Now, the chalk is one part of the system, but another important part of the system is the Cotswolds limestone. As we just pass over the Jurassic clays, and we're going to come to overlooking the limestone. So uh, the question is, how do we model, model the Cotswolds? Well, we understand them to a lesser extent than the chalk, and they are certainly very complex. So we've decided to take a sort of lumped approach. So we've, got, we've divided it up into 15 to 20 chunks, and each chunk models a, a single groundwater head. Now what you're looking at here on the top right of the screen is the match between the modelled um, flow and, and observed flow for the River Thames at Ainsham. And as probably you'd expect, we're pretty pleased with that. So I'm showing some graphs that are actually quite good. And the bottom left is the Thames right at its source. And again, the match is pretty good. So now we're going to leave the the Cotswolds and as you can see uh, you, as we look over the to, the to the north you can see that some of the complexity of the Cotswolds itself and so the question is we've got a number of different chunks of the system is how we actually put them together. So how do we link these models together? Well the way we're going to do that is with um, the model linking standard OpenMI and we're going to have three elements to the system. We're going to have a very large chalk model, you've just seen the red contours and we can see the distributed grid of the model there in the centre of the screen, and then also the Cotswolds model we've just been discussing earlier. Now, as I said, that we the way that the models exchange water, or the way the system exchange water, is to and from tributaries of the Thames. So the third element of the system is a model of the Thames itself. And we link all these together. And the aim is that we can provide a sort of coherent understanding and simulation of water resources in the Thames basin as a whole. So now we're going to leave the Thames and I'm going to fly you further north up to the Lincolnshire coast. And as we pass over uh, the landscape, what we're showing here is the uh, 1 to 50k ditch map geological mapping we produce. But more importantly, these fence diagrams you see form part of the national geological model. And this is an important, under, important way that we can develop subsequent national process models using the understanding of geology um, developed by the National Geolog Geological Model to underpin that. So you can see we're starting to work at a larger and larger scale. And this is very important if we're going to actually answer some of the questions posed by decision makers. But what we're now going to do is look at going from taking fluid out of the system to getting rid of unwanted fluid or liquids. And we're going to look at the case of um, storing uh, supercritical CO2 underground so that we can um, mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And I'm going to take you to Mablethorpe um, where we looked at a hypothetical example, and I just like to repeat the word hypothetical, of injecting supercritical CO2 under the feet of the good citizens of Mablethorpe. And we did that by a series of uh, conceptual and modelling studies. And as we fly out you can see that the salmon pink to your left of the Permatriasic sandstone, and this was the target horizon, if you like, for um, injecting the supercritical CO2. So here on the screen you're seeing um, the layering from, again, another set of geological models, and the important thing is that we're, we're looking, we want to inject the CO2 into the primary aquifer, down here, the Permatriasic sandstone, and we want to keep it in place by the primary seal, which is the Mercia mudstone group overlying it. So again, we're using the results from colleagues' geological modelling to help us understand what's going on. So what we did with this information, we developed a conceptual understanding of what might be happening when we, div when we inject the um, compressed carbon dioxide into the Permadriasic group. And here you can see um, our conceptual diagram is looking at how the possible escape routes that the CO2 may have from being injected deep under the uh, feet of the good citizens of Mablethorpe. And it can either go up dip and then affect uh, rivers and springs or it can escape via faults or boreholes. Um, but this 
what this study showed is that there, there may be issues with onshore injection, so the likelihood is we'll switch to offshore. So we're now going to turn our back on the on Mablethorpe and go out to the North Sea. And as I said before, that the likelihood is that the UK will dispose of its carbon dioxide either using the existing infrastructure or the skills and know-how we've used to develop um, oil and gas resources in the North Sea. And it's likely that the CO2 itself will be injected very deep into the um, underlying rocks under the bed of the North Sea, something of the order of a kilometre deep, as you're seeing there. And one of the issues with um, injecting uh, carbon dioxide under the bed of the North Sea um, is whether it will have uh, an effect on other parts of the system. And here you're seeing a model that's been used to investigate what happens when you inject CO2 into the Brun Bunter sandstone um, into the North Sea. And what I'd like you to do is pay attention to this black line down the right of the screen here and this marks the boundary between the UK territorial waters and the Dutch territorial waters and one of the aspects of um, injecting CO2 into this area is that you can't have a pressure effect on the Dutch sector so we have to use the modelling to um, see if this occurs. So now what I'd like to show you is um, the results of the, the pressure modelling and what you're seeing on the screen is the, what you will see is the model outputs. And again, pay attention to the black line going through the centre of the screen, which is the different, which is the boundary between the UK national waters and the Dutch national waters. The black cross is where we're going to inject, and the white areas are faults in the Bunter sandstone themselves. So now you can see that the pressure gently develops and then passes. Um, over the national boundary between ourselves and Holland. So you can see that we can use model results to help us understand the impacts of dealing with both dealing with our um, extracting for resource purposes in the case of the Thames Basin or in terms of injecting our waste into, un into the underground spaces. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to fly back to London and as we do that we're going to pass over the UK and what you're seeing here is the results, the long-term average recharge from a national scale recharge model. So we're getting to the point where alongside our geological colleagues where we can produce national scale process models. And so ideally what we want to do is provide a range of models um, to help solve the problems for decision makers behind doors such as this. So we can provide models that provide the information on which decision makers can improve the way they respond to events. They could be short term, such as the um, Japanese tsunami or the Icelandic volcanic eruption, or more longer term um, situations such as the impact of climate change on water resources. So I've got just two more things to say. And firstly, as you'd expect with something of this complexity, it's, it, requir it required a range of people um, to produce. And I'd like to thank in particular Bruce Napier for doing the flyovers and Chris Waddell for the animation and putting it all together. So just I have to finally say thank you very much for your attention.